I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I want to enter my topic tonight uh, by taking the next step, actually, in my response to the person who asked me a question in the kind of pre-meeting meeting, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting your name, um, who asked me the question about uh, some people say that the way to meditate is to just engage in choiceless awareness, bear witnessing, no gaining mind, san san. Thank you, Elaine. Um, while others talk about the value of cultivating certain qualities, including concentration, or becoming increasingly absorbed in certain states or developing certain traits. And I said, well, I thought there was actually a range, a genuine range uh, of meditative practices that was true, it was real, and that uh, there's no specifically right place to be on that range. It really has to do with uh, your purposes and what you're dealing with at the time, keeping in mind that what may be procedurally really useful during meditation is not necessarily a way of life, or is perhaps not necessarily an entire way of life. Okay, so I wanna take that a step further because underneath the debates about where to be in that range is, an under, is a fundamental debate about the nature of human beings and the nature of mind broadly, and ultimately even the nature of uh, reality. And um, if your view is that uh, reality is this sort of, you know, materialistic falling of dominoes, this kind of clockwork, mechanistic falling of dominoes, then there's understandably the attitude that, oh, I, I'm going to take action. I'm a brick acting on a world of bricks to build a house. It's understandable. On the other hand, if your view is A, that that process of identifying oneself as a brick acting on other bricks to make houses is itself problematic, and if your view further is that actually, actually, the underlying nature of yourself and reality altogether is, is timeless and aware and loving and beautiful. Well, trying to whack on bricks to build a house is getting in the way of that. Best to just choof, fall back into it. You see these different orientations. Um, and you see the argument being made, which Dogen makes in the quotation that I put into the uh, chat um, at 44 minutes past the hour, take a look at it. Uh, the argument that he makes and many non-dual teachers make is that efforts to purify the mind, to release afflictions, to heal old wounds, to um, <clears throat> develop qualities in oneself, much like we would want to develop uh, characteristics in a, in a room in our home that we're trying to make nicer or a meal we're trying to make better, that those efforts that somehow make sense out in the world, you know, get in the way uh, of resting in who you already are if you try to engage them in your mind. There's much wisdom in that view. Chogyam Trungpa wrote about it in his book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, for example. And as I move into the topic of love tonight, we can see those two views about our nature um, in the mix. And we can see the two, we can see the spectrum of approaches. Uh, one view being that our nature is already deeply loving, uh, just just be who you already are. Uh, 
would that were so easy? Uh, the other view is it's a process of development, releasing, purification, clearing away, and, and training, and protecting, uh, and fostering qualities in ourselves. All right, you can see those two, two in the mix. Um, my own view, having been around the block in the kind of spiritual world, is that, and having been sort of whacked on repeatedly by people whose view is the is is that that you know choiceless um, uh, you're you're already whole just be who you already are end of the spectrum having been whacked on by them uh, I can appreciate that view and I've learned a lot from it uh, but what do we and not but and what do we see when we enter into practice, including in the spirit of Dogen's comment there, which uh, I read while on retreat recently and had an illuminating, even shattering in a good way, effect on me. Uh, as someone who's extremely good, I am extremely good at the first sentence there, conveying myself toward all things to carry out various kinds of efforts. Um, there really is a place for falling out, falling open, poof, poof, and trusting uh, underlying goodness, trusting underlying the underlying wellspring of the arising currents living through you as reality unfolds continuously at the emergent edge of now, whoosh, like a rising fountain that, have, that appears, and as it appears, it disappears to be replaced by the next fizzing, emerging droplets that are each of us. Whoosh, right? It is really something to do to engage in that practice. And you can see why, if uh, someone really values that second sentence, all things coming, coming, and carrying out practice enlightenment through the self. Ah. Should have added those three words. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, grasshopper. So I'm gonna put the proper full quotation in the chat. And by the way, uh, this attitude, which way are you looking? Uh, you know, can definitely influence how you um, deal with your mistakes. Boom. You know? So this is deep stuff. And um, what I find is that it really does help to have a have flashes of the sense of Dogen's second sentence, uh, expressed elsewhere in various ways, let go and let God. People might say it that way, perhaps in Alcoholics Anonymous culture, et cetera, et cetera, recovery culture of certain kinds. Um, you know, it, it's really helpful to have a sense of what that's like, to have a sense when you're just talking with someone where you completely give up, you drop all pretense, you're no longer trying to influence them. You're no longer trying to make anything in particular happen inside their mind. You're not defending yourself. You're like, you, you just give it all up. Ugh. You're broken open, wide open, like, and you're just being you. Trusting, if that's even a thing. It's when you're like completely broken open, it's not even a matter of trusting yourself. There's no one who's trusting you. You're just like, there. Um, you know, know what that's like. Know what it's like to give up profoundly and fall back into the arms of reality. And like give up, shattered, shattered open, splattered wide open. Uh, it's important to know what that can feel like, not in the sense of being traumatized and dissociated, um, 
devast I don't mean this in the sense of being devastated and fragmented and blown apart. I mean it in the in the sense that that feels like what a relief. You know? Uh the abandonment of stressful striving utterly. Whew. Know what that's like. I think that's really important to know what that's like. If only for a second while you meditate or only for a moment with another person. And then over time, um, we can make efforts to foster that kind of effortlessness. And we can make efforts, in, and part of that is to make efforts so that those experiences of Dogen's second sentence um, become more and more deeply rooted in us. They become more and more our habit, our way of being in the world. Which, by the way, in order to sustain that quality of surrender and um, not guiding or controlling of oneself, boy, it really helps to have developed certain strengths around it so that you can protect yourself and, and live with other people in effective ways. So the two come together. And I think that um, people who leave out uh, <clears throat> an awareness of our underlying true nature are really missing out on a lot. Also, I've seen and I believe that people who um, dogmatically exclude gradual cultivation and deliberate efforts inside the mind, <laughs> I, I just think are naive at best about um, our biology and the world we live in and the actual process of full practice as laid out by the Buddha and many other wise people. Um, the question that gripped Dogen, a great Zen master, roughly 1200 or so, in his life's journey uh, was the, some base, the question of, if we are already enlightened, why do we have to practice? Which gets right at the combination of these two things that we're exploring here. All right. And um, the resolution of that, I mean, is very, is very profound. I mean, it's beyond my capacity to express fully and, or live fully right now, but it's the two together. You know, it's the enactment of all things coming and carrying out practice through this self, moment by moment by moment, including those practices coming through the self of cultivation and purification. In that moment, in Dogen's writing, is nirvana. Not separated from us, not um, a one-off experience in some extraordinary state of cessation and return, but rather uh, an ongoing uh, opportunity for us in this lived life, in any moment in which we are lived by all things flowing through us in the enactment of this moment. To Dogen, that's nirvana now. So in that context, how do we watch the news these days? How do we grapple with the complexities of most long-standing historical issues in the world? How do we uh, interact with our children, our parents, our friends and family, our adversaries? You know? And here's where I want to explore with you very kind of intimately what I call you know, the power of love broadly. And I want to start with um, the quotation from the Buddha 
uh, that you may be familiar with. Um, it comes from the uh, Loving Kindness uh, Sutta. Uh, I'll quote it here. I posted it at 39 minutes past the hour. Uh, and by the way, if you don't have access to the quotations in the chat because you've come in after I posted them, so that's how Zoom works, uh, maybe other people can you know, pay, cut and paste, uh, copy and paste rather, uh, some of those quotations and just drop them in you know, again and again. So here we go. As a mother would risk her life to protect her child, her only child, even so uh, should one cultivate a limitless heart with regard to all beings. And I want to point to what you might have experienced already, perhaps even in the meditation we did, focusing on the combination of appreciating and wishing well, uh, seeing the good even in those we oppose, uh, you might have had a sense both of something vast and almost impersonal uh, that was you were, that you were tapping into, maybe that was moving through you, that um, limitless heart that, that's already available to us if we can just get in touch with it. And you might have also observed the skillful benefits of a certain gentle nudging of your own mind, including a, a nudging away of things that might distract you from sustaining the embodied experience of this, of, of this way of being, right? The two together right there. And um, I want to invite you to consider uh, two different ways of orienting to the Buddha's recommendation here. He's, he's giving us an instruction. He's giving us certainly a recommendation. And then we need to see for ourselves as he teaches about it. Um, do you orient to this as, well, if I like them? Um, you know, there's a there's a question in you know an IQ test of you know, it might be dated at this point. Essentially, it's a it's about common sense, social reasoning, uh, and I was giving this test to a, a teenager who was basically a juvenile delinquent, and uh, for all kinds of complicated reasons, uh, many of them not his own fault. Certainly, in any case, I asked him this question, standard question. So, what should you do if you see thick smoke? coming out of the windows of your neighbor's home. And they're kind of, oh, there's a zero point answer, a one point answer and a two point answer. And he paused and reflected and he was a bright uh, young man. And he said, well, do I like them? Right? That gets a zero, but <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a level of moral reasoning that's at the bottom, <clears throat> pure self-interest. Um, <clears throat> So in the extreme, uh, do we like them? You know, do we have a, a limited heart for some beings, right? Uh, is it about the beings? Have they been nice to us? Do we like them? Do we approve of them? Do they vote the way we think they should? Uh, and that's one way. Another way to orient here, and I invite you into this experience if you're not that in touch with it yet, is to kind of think of what the Buddha is talking about as radiating outward from you in all directions as a kind of field, a sort of uh, unilateral, unconditional orientation toward life as, as a kind of a heart, a heart oriented, a heartfelt orientation through which people move, through which things happen. So your fundamental orientation that you protect and you value and you nurture inside yourself is not about them. It's not contingent on them. It's really about you. You are a person who wishes others well. Independent of that field, that radiating, rippling field of, of you know, goodwill, um, are specific behaviors that do uh, depend on what other people do. They are contingent, they are conditional. Uh, we can have this limitless heart, um, and certainly as the, the Buddha did, while also addressing other people 
<laughs> as he did from time to time, as best we know, as oh foolish being, right? You know, remonstrating with them, correcting them, pointing out the error of their ways, as exhorting them. Uh, we, in other words, you know, choosing to disengage, choosing not to respond, making choices inside this field, right? They're not contradictory. And for me, it's a great uh, refuge. And, and there's a lot of research these days, by the way, in brain science about the protective, uh, self-protective nature of broadly lovingness. For example, during compassion, it's bittersweet. We have empathy for the pain. We have the sweet of our tender, caring, motivated concern to relieve suffering. And the sweet releases neurochemicals in the brain that are protective and rewarding and calming, easing. And um, so uh, while there may be empathy fatigue or empathy burnout, um, you know, it takes a lot to have compassion fatigue genuine compassion fatigue, particularly if we're resting in and very aware of the sweet, um, right? So this refuge that my lovingness, your lovingness, your decency, your fundamental intention, the Buddha is speaking here about an intention one should cultivate. That's the intention, the intention of cultivation, a limitless heart. That intention and the feeling of your own limitless heart can be really protective even when you're, especially when you're with people who are throwing, you know, arrows and daggers at you, even literally. You see the distinction? Track the distinction? Imagine relationships or situations or interactions. Imagine resting in an interaction with someone who's really difficult, who's coming right at you. Um, you know, protecting yourself appropriately, disengaging if you need to, stepping back, slowing down, etc. But knowing your own good heart while they are doing their thing and you are deciding how to respond. How does that feel? It's really useful. And the capacity to rest in that good-heartedness. You might be upset. Yeah, it's real. I get. I, it's real. I get upset. I'm rattled. I'm like, can I? Uh, but I know I have a fundamentally, you know, good-hearted intention, uh, and and an intention to cultivate good-heartedness. Right? That's a refuge, and so we can train in that and develop that trait over time, so that you know, when the oatmeal really starts to fly, when people, you know, the intensity rises. Uh, the challenge increases, you know, we're more and more able to rest there. This is something we can develop over time. And in that development, again, going back to these two truths, you know, the two, the two tracks, the two wheels of the wagon of awakening, we can even increasingly locate and trust in and rest in this unconditional lovingness, um, this unconditional benevolence, Fundamental benevolence, uh, not malevolence. A fundamental benevolence inside us that's that's um, innate, and is by the way, not. It is indestructible. Is my view as a longtime psychologist. No matter how traumatized a person is, no matter how tainted they feel, there is a fundamental benevolence in in all of us um, that is just untainted, unstainable indestructible, unshakable. And we can find that. And as we repeatedly find it and repeatedly find our home in it, then we're more and more able to stay in touch with it as the great sages and saints throughout history have been able to do and great political activists have been able to stay in touch with that. Um, like Martin Luther King and others, um, you know, we're more and more able to rest there. So think about that for yourself. A beautiful meditation uh, is to, you know, find it and at least have flashes of, intimations of, and increasingly be lived by that innate lovingness, that innate benevolence in the core of your being.
So let me take a peek at the 28 new messages that have come in while I've been speaking. All right. Yeah, so here we go. 10 minutes past the hour. It's public, so you can see it. A person calling themselves an expert gave me advice on a basic issue that proved to be poorly researched and costly. I do not feel so good-hearted toward them. Yeah, that's right. And I think when we bring to mind people that for us are edge cases, it's hard to find a genuine and authentic good-heartedness. And here's where, to paraphrase this beautiful teaching from Larry Yang, uh, something, and someone might post it as well, uh, you know, may I be loving toward everyone. If I may not be loving toward everyone, may at least I be kind. If I cannot be kind, may I be compassionate. If I cannot be compassionate, may I not do harm. If I may not do any harm, may I do as little harm as possible. So you, we can see that realistically. Okay, and a lot of times people will go out to edge cases like some world leader that um, is you know, genuinely contemptible. Uh, wow, can't find compassion or good heartedness for them. So poof, just blow up the whole pro the whole thing. No, that's a reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> you know, where, where you go all the way out to something that's absurd and go blah blah and blow up the whole thing. No, um, we find those that we can you know experience really a genuine kindness or friendliness or lovingness for. Great, but independent from a specific response to a specific person that's authentic in us. Can we rest in, as the Buddha teaches, a kind of omnidirectional, unconditional intentionality, you know, a fundamental benevolence rather than malevolence? We're not mean. We don't want to grind them down. You know, we don't, that feels bad. It feels like a poison, because it is. We want to rest in that clear-eyed benevolence while being crystal clear about what we're dealing with. You know, the value in that. Okay, so I now, great, want to go back to the next quotation I dropped in. So here we have the next one that I think is just fantastic. Uh, and I think I put it as the opening quotation in one of my books. Outstanding behavior, blameless action, open hands to all, and selfless giving. This is a blessing supreme. Sometimes people say that, you know, that contemplative practice in general, or Buddhism in particular, is narcissistic navel gazing. I just think that's a completely ignorant, at best, uh, statement. Throughout the contemplative traditions of the world and con throughout secular traditions of mindfulness is a very strong emphasis on virtue, on uh, sila in Buddhism, restraint, um, wise action, proper conduct. And here we have a great summary from the Buddha. He's really calling us outstanding behavior. Whoa, that's a bar. You know, that's a high bar, right? Okay, aspirational. Uh, blameless action. You know, no fault. We may make mistakes, but we did not have bad intentions. We weren't out to hurt people. We weren't negligent. We just didn't know any better. Okay, a mistake was made, and we learned from it. Open hands to all. Think about that as an orientation in divisive times. Maybe we disagree with other people. You know, we have, I have my own pretty well considered, uh, a pretty knowledgeable uh, understanding of actual facts and pretty considered um, a views based on my values connected to those facts. And still, can I approach others who uh, I really disagree with and who I personally think are uh, deliberately ignorant of the actual relevant facts and are hurting a lot of people. That's my opinion. I could be wrong. They might think I'm that way. 
In any case, independent of all that, poof, are the hands open or clenched? Or dismissive and rejecting? Open hands. That's interesting. Yeah. Buddha has a line, uh, give no person cause to fear you. They may have cause to anticipate certain consequences, you know, that are realistic and 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 so forth. But it's not that we're trying to scare them. You're not trying to terrify them. You know, you're not engaging in acts of terrorism. You're not trying to make people afraid of you. And selfless giving. You know, a kind of fundamental generosity. Um, <laughs> when you meet someone, let's say you're you're having dinner out in a restaurant, or maybe some people are I, somebody's delivering something in your home. I'm thinking of examples in my you know privileged life. Uh, maybe you um, are just getting introduced to someone for the first time, and in, a, in any condition, maybe someone is walking past you on the street that is a total stranger and you'll never see again. Okay, right there. Are you looking for what's good in them? Are you deliberately, out of a habit, looking for what's good in them? Maybe you're you know, kind of intuitively aware of, what, of the suffering in them or something, the stress, the fatigue, the irritability, the worry, um, the pressure, okay. Are you also perhaps recognizing good qualities in them, especially if you have an opportunity for more than a few seconds of interaction with them? Are you really looking for those good qualities in them? And could they feel that you are looking for what's good in them? Wow. Um, is that your general orientation toward people? And even when you're with people who are familiar to you, you know, uh, I've been married over 41 years now, and um, it's easy to take people for granted, family members, neighbors, coworkers. Uh, can you look at them through um, the eyes of a child, as the proverb puts it, through don't know mind, through beginner's mind, as Suzuki Roshi put it, uh, and see freshly, oh, What's good in them? That's a remarkable kind of generosity. And can they feel it? Right? Think about the, unfortunately, probably rare occasions when you actually felt that someone was looking for what was good in you. Not because they were desperately <laughs> struggling to find something, anything good in you, but rather that it was just their orientation. They were recognizing them, some of the many good things about you. Wow, how did that feel? It's such an incredible a gift, right? Well, we have the chance to give that to other people routinely. That's a very simple form of generosity. And then on the heels of uh, finding, you know, recognizing suffering and also recognizing what's good in other people, um, often actions follow. Like we support them. We, we join with them rather than separate and dismiss or put down. So simple, in just 10 seconds of interacting with the waiter or the Uber driver or the delivery person or the shopkeeper um, or your brother, your mother, your daughter. So simple, so powerful. Practice in daily life. Okay. And then, um, by the way, this, this one here, I want to really recommend to you. It's, it's something genuinely I've cultivated. Uh, maybe a little bit it was natural, but I really have cultivated it to an extent that it can embarrass my kids in a restaurant. But because um, very quickly I'm into talking to the waiter about the book they could write. <laughs> so, but it's really, it's really something to feel like you are in the field of someone who sincerely is interested in you in the frame of whatever the rest, you know, the relationship is and 
the interaction might be, that they're sincerely interested in you um, and, are, and are finding things to like about you and appreciate about you and, and um, want to support about you. Wow. Okay? And then um, I want to finish on this teaching from Albert Schweitzer. <clears throat> if there is anything I have learned about people, it is that there is a deeper spirit of altruism than is ever evident. Albert Schweitzer, by the way, uh, was someone that I became aware of when I was fairly young. He, he, he died when I was fairly young, I think. Uh, and um, um, he was a great philanthropist and activist, working a lot in Africa, a great humanitarian. Uh, he really walked the talk. So that's, who, that's the voice here. Um, just as the rivers we see are minor compared to the underground streams, so too, the idealism that is visible is minor compared to what people carry in their hearts, unreleased or scarcely released. Humankind is waiting and longing for those who can accomplish the task of untying what is knotted and bringing these underground waters to the surface. So here, Schweitzer is speaking again about these two things, true nature being the underlying the underground waters of our un inherent underlying altruistic lovingness and the practices, the deliberate cultivation of untying what is knotted and uncovering these underground waters and bringing them to the surface. We have these two aspects. And then second, I found myself thinking about this related to, and we can pick so many regions of the conflict zones, Taiwan, mainland China, Sub-Saharan Africa, Ukraine, is Israel and Gaza and Palestine, uh, the Middle East. You can just think of so many regions in the world. And what strikes me is that it's really important to be aware of both the, the current reality in its complexity. Nothing left out, as they say in Zen. The current reality fraught, terrifying, brutal, awful, so many ways. And the opportunity, the opportunity that Schweitzer is talking about. And I think it's so important to be able to hold on to that vision of the possible. And I think, honestly, uh, this may sound a little curmudgeonly, I think uh, some people lose their courage to see opportunity, to see possibility for what humanity could be. It's important to be brave enough and to stand up against those who would want to dispirit us, who'd want to get us, who want to divide us, humanity as a whole, and who want to make us doubt ourselves, doubt our inherent goodness, doubt the inherent goodness in others, even if we are bitterly opposed to them, for good reason, perhaps. Um, and to see and hold on to the vision of the opportunity that is possible in the way we can live together. Realistically, absolutely in the ways that humanity, we lived with each other inside our bands for 97% of the time, 290,000 or so, give or take. A few years we've walked the earth until the last 10,000 or so. Uh, in our bands, we lived on the basis of compassion and justice, caring and sharing. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't, we weren't at war with each other inside our bands. Between bands, often not so good. Inside bands, compassion and justice. This is natural to us. And we have to find a way to, to scale that up to the band, the one single band of, the, of Homo sapiens, the human species. Humanity altogether, all eight billion of us. That's a great, a great project. But but it must begin with a vision of the opportunity and what's possible, and have the gumption and the courage to stand up for that possibility and stand against those who say, ah, you're trying to boil the ocean. A vehicle that I've uh, been involved in starting, as you may know, is the Global Compassion Coalition. You can learn about it on the website there. Uh, we just actually released a statement today about the situation in the Middle East. It's, uh, I think, very well stated. 
you can see for yourself. But in any case, globalcompassioncoalition.org, please join the coalition. Uh, 92,000 as of today and growing by several thousand a week. Um, you're all welcome. So I hope you'll join. Um, and actually related to that in conversation with someone, my friend, Ann Royce, who I hope will be a guest teacher soon, um, affiliated with Spirit Rock and elsewhere, there's another quotation that she shared with me from the great James Baldwin. What a being. Highly recommended to learn about him, to read his work. I'll read it. He was responding to those, um, I think maybe Faulkner, William Faulkner from the South and others that we're talking about in the 50s and 1950s, 1960s or so as context in America, maybe into the 1970s, and obviously in the long legacy and the brutal legacy of enslavement of people for centuries in America on whose backs are, much of our country was built. Um, have never received appropriate reparation and compensation for all of that. In that context, Baldwin says, where am I here? For those who would say, well, this, you know, we'll just keep trying, maybe it'll get better someday. In other words, those who say, don't have a fierce clarity about what is actually possible for how we can live together. Baldwin writes, there is never time in the future in which we can in which we will work out our salvation there is never time in the future or a time in the future in which we will work out our salvation the challenge is in the moment the time is always now now is the time for us to embody what we know already we know cuz it's our nature we know because it's our birthright, the lovingness, the benevolence that's at the core of our being underneath everything else. You know, it's, it's time to be brave enough to embody what we know in our relationships, guided by the wisdom of great beings like the Buddha, James Baldwin, and others uh, who guide us, who light our way, you know, working out the practical details and figuring stuff out as we go along. Yep. But fundamentally, trusting in our own good nature and being brave enough and determined enough and diligent enough to keep enacting it as best we can out there in the world. And taking refuge, as Dogen says, not in a fixation on outer forms, but really finding refuge in a trusting in and a surrendering to, and a repeatedly experiencing, and getting those neurons to fire together and wire together, repeatedly experiencing the underlying wellsprings of innate benevolence, innate goodness, shining through you, shining through your eyes, uh, <laughs> even when they're closed. And you can feel how you can really come to rest. And I invite you in our last minute here to come to rest in your own tender heart, uncomplicated, deeper than any word I've said tonight. Yeah. Trusting in, wow. Even naming to yourself that you're just a fundamentally benevolent person. That trust in. You know, that boundless heart radiating in all directions. Not naively, trusting in that. Being strong enough to trust in that and then being guided by that heart as you engage in skillful, necessary action with other people. Lived by love lived by the love that you are. This is the world we can make together.